I read you Ephesians a few moments ago, which was pivotal for the Reformers. Here's the other verse, and this is the verse uh, from the book of Romans, the letter to the Romans, that did it for Martin Luther. The righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. As it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. A woman I know of who was raised Jewish in the States, but actually attends uh, Christian services now in London, England, has been brutally frank about her views on religion. I believe totally in God, she says, but religions, all religions, have screwed up. Then she went further. Christianity should have swept the board, won over everyone. As far as religions are concerned, no other faith can hold a candle to Jesus Christ. His teaching, everything he stood for, could have changed the world. Love God, love your neighbor. What better or purer or more accessible teaching can there be? But Christianity, she added wistfully, like all the others, like the religion of my own Jewish people, has demeaned itself, drained itself of all that is most compelling, most compelling about it. Give me a minute to think about that. Because I think, sadly, there's a lot of evidence that she's correct. Religions, all religions, have screwed up. Haven't you noticed that every religion has dark periods when it went off the rails? Pretty easy to see with some cases right now. Muslim extremists today in our generation, Buddhism in Japan marched that nation right into World War II and right now is perpetrating religious and ethnic cleansing in Myanmar. We know our own faults in Christianity. I'm not going to attempt to recount them and I won't deny them. We had crusades, residential schools, You know the list. So what's the solution? Dump all religion? Don't have anything? Well, the Soviet Union tried that for 70 years. That didn't work out. Didn't create a perfect society. And they're still trying to recover a quarter century after communism's fall. Because the flaw you see is in the human heart. Every religion can be perverted and distorted by sinful humans. So I go back to that American Jew, the woman who said all religions have screwed up, because she also said no other faith can hold a candle to Jesus Christ. And I agree. The issue is not our founder and our Lord and Savior. What's happened is we've needed continual correctives and renewal and reforming. And in the 2,000 years since Jesus, the greatest positive renewal began 500 years ago this month in a university town in Germany. A theology professor and monk, fiery, earthy, eccentric, started a movement we know as the Protestant Reformation. His name was Martin Luther, after which the great civil rights, black civil rights leader of a generation ago, Martin Luther King, was named. King was named after the great reformer. 500 years ago, the world was split on Martin Luther. One Catholic thought Martin Luther was, quote, a demon in the appearance of a man. Another, who initially questioned Luther's theology, later declared, he alone is right. So now, 500 years hence, the verdict's nearly unanimous for the good. Thumbs up on Martin Luther. But Catholics and Protestants 
affirm he was not only right about a great deal, he changed the course of Western history and changed it for the better. So how did it happen? What's the backstory? Where did this guy come from? What was going on? Martin Luther was born about 120 miles southwest of Berlin to Margaret and Hans Luder. <laughs> you don't have to write this down. <laughs> but I thought I'd give you a few details. His father, Hans, worked at the local copper mines. Martin was very exceptionally bright, gifted in today's sense. Hans sent him to Latin school. And then when Martin was only 13 years old, Hans sent him to study law at the University of Erfurt. And Martin earned degrees, a bachelor's, a master's, in the shortest time allowed by university statutes. This kid was bright. He proved so adept at public debates that he earned the nickname the philosopher because he could really go at it. He was on the path to being a successful lawyer, but something happened. The, the most compelling incident, there are a lot of things went behind this, but in 1505, he was walking from one town to another and he got caught in a violent, severe thunderstorm a bolt of lightning struck the ground near him. He took shelter under a bridge and cried out, Help me, Saint Anne, I will become a monk. And he kept his vow. Scrupulous, committed. He gave away all his possessions and entered the monastic life. I wonder what his dad thought. They never interviewed him. Because his dad thought he was going to be a great jurist. Nope. He went into monastic life, and Luther was extraordinarily successful as a monk. He plunged into prayer, fasting, ascetic practices. He went without sleep to punish himself. Uh, he endured bone-chilling cold without uh, using a blanket, and he beat himself. This was part of that medieval mindset. As he later commented, if anyone could have earned heaven by the life of a monk, it was I. Though he sought by these means to love God fully, he didn't have peace in his spirit. He couldn't get feeling right. He was increasingly terrified of the wrath, the judgment, the punishment of God. The church in the Middle Ages emphasized human sin and eternal punishment, damnation, fires of hell. Young Martin became obsessed with trying to live a perfect life, with confessing his sins daily, several times a day, and trying to keep his slate clean. And meanwhile, he was ordered to keep going at the university, take his doctorate, which he did, and became a professor at Wittenberg University. And it was during lectures on the Psalms in 1513 and 1514. And then a study of the letter to the Romans. I read one verse at the start here. Luther began to see a way through his dilemma, his obsession, his fear, terror at an angry God. And he wrote, At last, meditating day and night by the mercy of God, I began to understand that the righteousness of God is by a gift of God, namely by faith. Here I felt as if I were entirely, listen to this, I felt as if I were entirely born again and had entered paradise itself through the gates that had been flung open. So Luther began internally to change and his thinking began to expand. God was no longer just wrathful and punishing. The mercy of God, the righteousness. And on the heels of this, as this happened in his thinking, new understandings came about other things. To Luther, the church was no longer the institution defined by apostolic succession. At, at that point in the medieval church, um, the hired pro 
was considered elevated up on a pedestal. Now, you guys know better than that. But in that day, priests, cardinals, bishops, they controlled economics. They controlled the feudal system. They could tell a local uh, king or magistrate how he would run his territory. Luther began to see, and, and all of that uh, power was passed down by apostolic succession, that is, succeeding the apostles. It was supposedly passed down from Peter, James, John, laying on of hands at the ordination, and all new priests and bishops were supposedly imbued with this wisdom and this power. And Luther began to say, wait a minute, it's not something that you can pass on that way. He began to see things differently. Faith no longer consisted of agree, agreeing just to the teachings of the church. You didn't agree with everything necessarily that the hierarchy said. And so it wasn't long before the revolution in Luther's thinking and proclamations played itself out throughout Europe. What Luther went through could, I think, be a common experience, this, this uh, mental and spiritual change he went through. So I want to hit pause for a minute and just process this, and I kind of want to pray, if we can. Um, guys, Dave? I, I, sorry, I, I hate to cut it on you, but I just, I really have to say this. I mean, I could stand up here and I could whine about this or that, but at the end of the day, who am I kidding? What's the biggest barrier for me? Is me. What's the number one thing that's keeping me from God? <laughs> this guy. I mean, come on, man. I can't be the only one that, that doesn't let God in. Most of us are spiritually unfit. <laughs> I'm like a spiritual couch potato. I mean, we do most things for ourselves. And we, you know, we, we tell ourselves we're just really independent people. We don't need to ask for help. Or we tell ourselves we're not worthy of God's love. We think of all the bad things that we've done and we can't imagine how we could ever be forgiven. Or, or we, you know, we try and reconnect with God. Maybe we say a rote prayer, one that we've said a thousand times before, and it's just lost all meaning. It's become limp and lifeless. Do we really mean what we're trying to say? Or are we just going through the motions? And is that okay? Just stop. Guys, humor me for a second, okay, here? Everybody just stop and, and take a breath, all right? Now let's pray. Father God, most holy and most compassionate, thank you. Thank you for surrounding me with the light of your love. Thank you for surrounding me with your protection and guidance. Thank you for healing and strengthening my mind so that I can see the way forward. And thank you for making it clear and obvious the way to follow. There. Can you feel it? The presence in the room has changed. Now, think about how many thoughts go through your mind in a day. How many of those thoughts are self-deprecating? How many of them are really filling your mind with God's love? I know I, I spend way too much time thinking about the past, thinking about all the things that I'd like to do over, remembering how much simpler life was back in the day. But then there's those future thoughts also. You know, we get stuck thinking about our to-do lists and... How much better life is going to be once we get the kitchen renovated or once we finish building the shed in the backyard or once we take care of that issue that just doesn't seem to want to go away. Remove all that from your mind. All the past thoughts, all the future thoughts, all the negative mind-driven thoughts and all the well-intentioned but stress-inducing thoughts and just silence them. And just be here now with God. He's here with us. He's been waiting for us. 
He thinks we're wonderful. And he knows all the awesome stuff about us. But he also knows that we keep beating ourselves up. And so he's so happy that we're here with him now. He's so happy that we're letting him heal us. That's all I got. Back to you, Orv. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I agree with this, by the way. I, I actually think that's a pretty accurate depiction of many people's faith understanding, and frankly, it was like that 500 years ago in Luther's day. We uh, quote, this is part of what uh, Dave said, we tell ourselves we aren't worthy enough for God's love. Luther did that. We remind ourselves of all the things that we've done and done wrong. But hopefully, Luther, and like Luther, we have a spiritual awakening, like Dave was talking about. We move away from this paint-by-numbers religion into that trusting relationship. I love the prayer he did, just that almost whispered, Father God, most merciful, most compassionate, thank you. Thank you for surrounding me with the light of your love. That's where Luther got to. That's where we want to get to. Part of what happened in the Protestant Reformation was a rediscovery of the reality of grace and faith. But that didn't happen right away. It was a process. And I want to talk you through a bit of the process, just a bit of history. It started, as I've said, 500 years ago this month on All Hallows' Eve, October 31st, All Saints' Eve. Luther's act that day, October 31st, was it wasn't an act of rebellion. He wasn't trying to start a revolution at all. It, in fact, it was just the opposite. As a, a dutiful son of the church, as a priest, Luther wanted to help uh, a discussion, a conversation, to keep uh, the faith community, to keep the church pure and good and, and righteous. And so what he did was he nailed to the door of the cathedral in Witt Wittenberg, Germany, 95 bullet points, 95 theses. He was really, at that point, he was really concerned about uh, actions the church was using in Germany to raise money for the building of St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. <clears throat> Here's what happened. And John, this isn't in my notes. <laughs> um, they're trying to build St. Peter's in Rome. Michelangelo, remember all that stuff? Some of you have been there. They need money. And so they're trying to get money from all of Europe, not just from the Italian. And so the Pope issued what are called indulgences. I'm going to put it as a get-out-of-jail-free pass for sin and for punishment. And if you paid a certain amount, you could have your grandmother come out of purgatory and straight to heaven, or you could buy your way out of punishment, purgatory, and to heaven. And so uh, Pope Leo gave a contract to the uh, king, the emperor in Germany, Frederick, he subcontracted to a, a preacher named Johann Tietzel. And he said, you keep 50% of what you get, I'll take the rest and it'll go to Rome. And so this guy was going around selling indulgences, get out of purgatory passes. And Luther said, wait a minute, that's not how it works. I read the Gospels, I read the New Testament a little differently. And so that triggered, but Luther had a whole list. He had 95 things, in fact, that he wanted to discuss. And he, uh, he nailed it to the Wittenberg door. I think we have a picture. Uh, John was there with his uh, Minolta and, uh, yeah, there it is, good. <laughs> And this wasn't uh, an outrageous or eccentric thing. The church door functioned as an ac academic bulletin board in those days. So it was an appropriate place to notify fellow faculty members of a faculty meeting, a discussion that they're going to have. Luther 
also a good son of the church, dutifully sent a copy to Archbishop Albert. Following church courtesy, he let his uh, superiors know. But the, here's what changed everything. This was 1517. A couple of decades before, a man named Gutenberg in Germany had developed a printing press. Until then, everything was handwritten. And so to get a copy of Luther's 95 theses, bullet points, somebody would have had to handwrite it all out. But we don't know who. Somebody took his, uh, his 95 points off the door, set, typeset it, ran it hundreds of copies off, and it went all over Germany. And they translated, Luther wrote it in Latin, it was translated into the German, into vernacular, and all of a sudden the whole country and most of Europe was discussing whether indulgences and some of the present church practices were allowed. It quickly evolved not into a debate about the spiritual points, it, it evolved into an argument whether the Pope had authority to do what he was doing. And Luther was put on trial um, at a, an event called, and literally, the Diet of Worms. How would you like to know that um, that was a key part of your nutrition for Christianity, the Diet of Worms? Um, the Diet of Worms was a council in the German city of Worms, but it, it translated out as Diet of Worms. Um, Luther, in 1521, he was called there. He thought it was just going to be an academic debate. It, it turned into really a trial. And he was ordered to recant and apologize all his views. Luther replied, and he had all of the powerful men of Germany and of Europe, bishops, kings, everybody was there. Luther replied to the demand to recant, unless I can be instructed and convinced with evidence from the Holy Scriptures or with open, clear, and distinct grounds of reasoning, then I cannot and I will not recant because it is neither safe nor wise to act against conscience. And then in a famous moment, he threw his hand up and said, here I stand, I can do no other, God help me. He was allowed to leave while they debated because a lot of German people were so much in favor. They saw him as a, a patriot. Keep the money in Germany. Don't send it all to those Italians. And so Luther was allowed to leave that council, but within 48 hours he was branded a heretic uh, and convicted in abstentia. There was a lot of subterfuge. He ended up being kidnapped by a, a local feudal lord who hid him in his castle to protect him. And he lived there for 10 months until things blew over. Fascinating history. I wonder if you'd be sitting here in this pew and listening to this if some of this hadn't happened, which is why I'm laying all this history on, on you. He came back early in the spring of 1522. Now he was able to return and carry on with the fledgling reform movement. Over the next few years, Luther entered into more and more debates and disputes. He actually became really cantankerous and cranky in his old years. He said some nasty things about, among others, about Jews. Hitler quoted him about the Jews, about popes about theological enemies. He used words not fit to print. I actually said, I, I think I said earlier, he was very earthy. He was an eccentric, bombastic guy, but he was right about the key theological points. He ended up translating the whole Bible into German, which was a landmark, and people began to actually read the scriptures. He wrote great hymns like A Mighty Fortress is Our God, and he stole a drinking song for it. Da, 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 da. It was almost like Roll Out the Barrel in Germany at that point. Luther took the tune and actually said, why should the devil have all the good tunes? 
And he took that tune, da 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 and wrote his own hymn to it, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Some of you remember that. Um, his later years, he was, um, it was the Middle Ages, they didn't have great medicine. He was ill a lot, but he also engaged in furious activity. Listen to this. In 1531, though he was sick for six months and suffered from exhaustion, he preached 180 sermons. He would preach midweek in the university chapel. He wrote 15 booklets or tracts. He worked on his Old Testament translation. He took a number of speaking trips. Finally, in 1546, he wore out. Luther died 1546, almost 30 years after he triggered the Reformation. His legacy is immense. It, it almost, it can't be summarized. Every Protestant reformer, every Protestant denomination was inspired by Luther in one way or another. If you've been around, you know I'm John Wesley's my guy, British Anglican priest who founded the Methodist movement. John Wesley had his spiritual awakening. Listen, this is straight out of his journal, 1738. Very reluctantly, I went to a meeting at Aldersgate Street. Someone was reading from Luther's preface to the epistle to Romans. This is 200 years after Luther. John Wesley sitting in a meeting. Someone read from Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans about a quarter to nine while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ. I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, saved me from the law of sin and death. Wesley's just one. Luther had this impact right across the centuries and still does. His reform unleashed forces that ended really the Middle Ages, ushered in the modern era. And lest we think that Protestants were the only ones that were corrected and Catholics are all, <clears throat> no. Within a generation of the split between Catholic and Protestant, there was a counter-reformation within the Roman Catholic Church, and it began to renew and correct itself very successfully. Today, the core beliefs of Christians and Catholics are the same. They really are. We worship a little differently. We have different styles, yeah, and we organize structurally. Our, our org, uh, flow chart is a little different. But what we believe about God, Jesus, sin, life, death is all the same. To prove that, I just want to read you from a Catholic priest preaching earlier this year at the Vatican to Pope Francis. This is directly from a sermon that was preached to Pope Francis. There is a danger that people can hear about the righteousness of God but not understand its meaning. The righteousness of God was what terrified Luther in his early years. So instead of being encouraged, they are frightened, as Luther was. And then this key sentence, the righteous live by faith. Luther deserves the credit. This is this Catholic priest. Luther deserves the credit for bringing the truth back when its meaning had been lost over the centuries, at least in Christian preaching. And it is this above all for which Christianity is indebted to the Reformation, whose fifth cent centenary occurs next year. Is that the quote? Yep. Father Paul Cantalamessa, the preacher at the Vatican. So, to finish off, I titled my sermon, Luther Nailed It. And look at, look at what they're doing. L the Luther Church, if you're uh, Lutheran in America, you can buy these t-shirts. <laughs> Luther Nailed It. I like the more updated one. I don't know if John can pull that one up. There it is. <laughs> 
In the weeks ahead, I plan to revisit Luther and the Protestant Reformation and examine then the key learnings. A lot of this was biography and history. In the next weeks, I want to talk about salvation as a gift of grace, which we accept on faith, the role of Scripture as our primary, not our only, but our primary guide and authority, and the concept of the priesthood of all believers, that this hierarchy, the hired pro up on the pedestal, Luther got us away from that, rightly so. It's been said that in most libraries, books by and about Martin Luther occupy more shelves than those concerned with any other figure except Jesus. Hard to prove, hard to verify, but I can understand why it's likely true. Amen. Let me pray for a moment. History is immense and it rolls on and on and on. And we thank you that we can look back at our spiritual parents, ancestors, see, see what they learned, how they continually renewed. Let it continually be so among us as well. Holy Spirit, eternal living God, be at work in your church and in our hearts. Amen.